Salman Rushdie, since we last spoke, you've also written a memoir called Joseph Anton about the time you spent living under the fatwa declared by the Ayatollah Khomeini in 1989. Before we get to that event, I'd like to go back, as you do in your book, to the beginning with how you were raised in Bombay in the 1950s. Your father inherited a fortune from his father, and he had a sign, a sort of plaque outside your house showing that he had a degree from Cambridge. Can you tell me a bit about him? Yeah, I think he was, um, he was kind of a very, very brilliant man in many ways, but I think his life didn't go the way it was, he would have wanted it to. You know, and he, he was not really, my father, my grandfather died young, and my father was an only child. And, and so he, at an early age, found that he had to take over the family business, and one of the things he was not was a businessman. I mean, he was scholarly, you know, and he, he, he went to Cambridge and studied English and then Oriental languages and spoke Arabic and Farsi, and, you know, it was in many ways very, more scholarly than me by far. And, but his life got shifted into this other, more mercantile sphere, which he sort of didn't have an aptitude for. And, I mean, to put, put it in brief, he basically inherited a lot of money and spent his life losing it and died broke. Um, very well timed the death. You know? <laughs> I, mean, lit I mean, literally, there was no money left in the bank. Um, so, how, did he, how did he manage to lose the family fortune? Oh, he had, that was a special talent of his. <laughs> <laughs> losing money, he was good at. Um, I mean, which I sort of inherited. Um, <laughs> never ask me for investment advice. Um, but he, you know, he just, he blew it. He, he invested in things that, that failed and, you know, he just lost a lot of money. And, and I just think he was a disappointed man in some way that his, his actual inclinations were more academic and, you know, reflective and thoughtful. And he was forced into this life which he would not have chosen for himself. You know? And, um, yeah, and then... He started drinking too much and, you know, it's a down, slippery slope. How would you describe your relationship with him? Well, it was, it was stormy. I mean, it was very good. He was very, very wonderful father of, of young children. I mean, he was storyteller, he was funny, he was playful, he was kind of wonderful. When my sisters and I all, you know, thought he was the magic parent of young children. But when the young children grew up and started having opinions, he was less able to deal with that. And so we all, we all sort of, you know, ended up having a strained relationship with him. But then, by the end of his life, uh, you know, it, it certainly in my case, it got, it got better again. Um, and when I wrote Midnight's Children, he got annoyed. Because, well, he got annoyed because there's a depiction of an alcoholic father. Yeah, yeah, which he thought, uh, which he thought was me being rude about him. And, and then I said, well, if I really wanted to be rude about you, I'd have put in all the things I left out. <laughs> <laughs> and that oddly didn't help. <laughs> well, uh, so, but then you see what happened is that all his friends started telling him how wonderful for him it must be that his son was doing so well. And so then he had to sort of stop being angry. Um, and so then he told me that he forgave me and that made me angry. I thought, you know what, I'm being forgiven for writing Midnight's Children. Thanks, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> um, but so we had this, you know, it was a bumpy relationship. Yeah, because you describe in, in Joseph Anton, and if you would tell me a, a little bit about when he took you to boarding school in England when, when you were 13. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you know, that was an awful moment because that was when his drink problem was at its worst. And we were sharing a hotel room, you know, in London for a couple of weeks before I went to boarding school. And, you know, he would get drunk every night and start abusing me, verbally, but in language I'd never heard. And this is something my mother, I guess, had managed to shield us from when she was there, but she wasn't there. So I became the target and was incredibly grateful to get to boarding school and get away from that. And, it, you know, that, that, was when, that was when things went wrong. So, uh, I mean, I think anybody who reads my books can see that there's fathers and sons have tough relationships in them. But one of the things that was very important to me, certainly, and I hope to him, was that before the end of his life, we really made it up. 
you know, and became, it was very fond at the end. Given that your father was so proud of being a, a Cambridge grad, why didn't he go to your graduation? I don't know the answer to that question. He didn't go. Neither of my parents came. I still, I kind of haven't forgiven them for it yet. They're both dead, you know? But yeah, it was awful, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know, you know? I, I, I kind of was too proud to ask them, why didn't you come? So that would have seemed like I wanted them there, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> I see a pattern here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, families, they fuck you up, your mum and dad. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 That's uh, Pache, Pache they, Philip they, Larkin. They, they, may not, they may not mean to, but they do. They give you all the faults they had and add some extra just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Philip Larkin. Philip Larkin. Philip right. Larkin, yeah. not me. Man hands down misery to man. It widens like a coastal shelf. Get out as quickly as you can and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> 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 when, when did you memorize that? <laughs> it, 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 it's a, such, such a cheerful verse. <laughs> Sticks in the mind. <laughs> as, as you were saying, shortly before his, his death, your father said that uh, he had been angry about Midnight's Children because every word you wrote was true. Yeah. How do you think he saw his own life? I think he saw it as, as disappointing. You know, I think he saw it as not the life he wanted to have. And I think many people do. Many people end up having the lives which are not the lives they dreamed of, you know, um, or even half dreamed of. Or even, maybe they didn't even formulate the dream, but they know that the life they've got is not what, you know, is this all there is? You know, I think that's, that's quite a common feeling. And I think I've always thought I was incredibly lucky to be able to make a life doing the thing I really wanted to do. Most of us don't have that, you know. Most people in the world don't get to spend their whole life doing only what they really want to do. And I have been able to do that ever since I was able to stop working in advertising anyway. <laughs> Which is, I have to say, the thing that first brought me to Banff because I was writing advertising for Air Canada. <laughs> and they sent me on a tour of Canada so I could write about Canada. And that's how I first came to this town 42 years ago. <laughs> and I must have liked it, because you see how often I come back. <laughs> also in your memoir, Joseph Anton, you describe your mother as a gossip of world class. Yeah, my mother knew where all the bodies were buried. You know? <laughs> my mother knew everything about everyone and relished in telling us secrets. You mustn't tell anybody this. <laughs> but you know your aunt so-and-so. Well, here's something you don't know about her. You know? <laughs> and, and eventually got to the point where she said to me, I'm going to stop talking to you because you put all this stuff in your novels that I get in, tr <laughs> I get in trouble, she'd say. Um, but um, she didn't stop. <laughs> So they were both storytellers, you know, I mean, both, because my, my father was where all these wonderful tales and all that. I mean, I got all of that from him, you know, um, and I got Ibn Rush from him. And I mean, I got, you know, there's an enormous amount of the way that I think uh, that, that came from him. I mean, his ideas about religion, you know, were also something that I got from him. Um, and my mother was this other kind of storyteller. She was this kind of social storyteller, secret stories, you know. Were you, were you close? Yeah, we were very close, yeah. Um, and she was really enjoyable because she really did know all the dirt on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you could just turn her on and let her go. You know, <laughs> and she would go for hours. <laughs> your mother also changed her name. She changed her first name uh, when, when she married your father. Yeah, well, she, very unusually for India in that generation, they, it was a second marriage for both of them. Um, and he asked her to change her name so that they could, as it were, have a kind of fresh start. And she did. Um, again, these were things we didn't discuss, really. You know, we didn't, I mean, I, we, all her life, she never talked to me about her first husband. 
she, yes, she who told all these stories didn't tell yeah, you about that. Yeah, she never talked about her first husband. And even so much so that when my father died, I, because she lived for a long time, he died, you know, he was 77 when he died, and she, was, she lived on for almost 20 years after that. And um, we discovered, my sister is better at nosing this stuff out than me, but that the first husband was still alive and had never remarried and was still friendly with her brother, my mother's brother, my uncle, and really wanted to see her. And so we said to her, look, you know, come on. You know, you were always really fond of him, and there's really no reason not to. You're not betraying anybody, you know. Just see her. She wouldn't see him. She wouldn't? No. I don't know why. I don't know whether it's because they'd been in love when she was young and gorgeous and she didn't want him to see her, in, you know, as an old lady. I don't know what it was, because she wouldn't talk about it. Um, so, yeah, about that she was very secretive, about herself. Uh, what was your parents' marriage like? Well, it was very long, you know, and... And... Uh, <laughs> and, and um, and, 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 you know, it was diffi I think it was very difficult for her because, because he had a serious drink problem. And she tried to shield us from it and etc. But, but, I mean, there's no doubt that they, in some way, did really love each other. And she was absolutely devastated when he died. Um, and meanwhile, of course, because we'd watched these arguments as children, my sister and I we would constantly ask them to get divorced. He would say, look, you know, you guys obviously don't get on. You know, we like you both a lot. And if you were in, like, separate houses, then we could enjoy seeing both of you and it would be better. And they didn't, they didn't accept our advice. <laughs> Oddly. Although your family was Muslim, they, they weren't devout. What, what was the attitude to religion at home when you were growing I think up? There just wasn't any, you know. I mean, we were excused religion. My father had zero interest in it. My, mother, my, mother, my mother's view was that she didn't want us to eat pork. That's, that, that was religion in our house. <laughs> religion was no pig. Right? That, that, was, that was it. And um, other than that, you know, I mean, every so often, like not even once a year, my father would suggest to me that we should go to kind of Eid prayers, you know, Eid being a big festival like Christmas, I guess. And I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know, you know the prayers were all in Arabic, I didn't know any of them, and, and you, know, you have to go up and down all the time. And, and, and he said, just do what I do. So we'd go and stand in this huge field of people praying and go down when he went down, and go up when he went down, and go home. That was it, it was this kind of curious up-down thing. <laughs> uh, in, in a language I didn't understand, you know. Arabic, uh, which nobody understood. That's the joke about, you know, it's, it's like when Catholic church services were in Latin and, and nobody understood what they were saying. You know, well, that's it's like that. Um, and it felt just, it really felt like religion just wasn't a subject. We didn't think about it. And, you know, it's, it's just a different age because religion wasn't such a subject for anyone um, at that time. It was a private matter. You know, people were either religious or not religious, but nobody particularly talked about it. And the idea, I mean, the idea that it would return to become, you know, the, the, the thing in the center of the room that everybody had to make a reckoning with, it seemed impossible to imagine that that would happen. Although back then, there's a description of your father as a godless man who knew and thought a great deal about God. And I wondered if there's a way in which that describes you too. Well, I mean, yeah, I think atheists are fascinated by religion because it's so nuts. <laughs> no, I mean, no, the truth is he was interested in the history and origins of, in particular, Islam because he said it was the only religion that was born inside recorded history. So one could study it as a historical event that you knew an enormous amount about the conditions of Arabia in the seventh century, the, you know, the, the social transformations, the economic issues, the, the, the kind of gender relations, the, a lot of it, the, the change from a matriarchal society to a patriarchal society, there's a lot we know about what was happening there. And, and, it's, and it's relatively easy to see 
if you just set aside the subject of who wrote the Quran and just think of it as a book that was created in that time, it's very easy to see how the circumstances of Arabia in that time are directly reflected in the way in which that book comes out. You know, so you can see it as a historical event. And, and he was interested in that. He was interested in looking at this thing, the birth of this big idea, as a historical event. And so, and yeah, so, so was I. I mean, I inherited that from him. Um, and I remember when I was going to Cambridge and doing a special paper in the, in the origins of Islam and, and, and coming across this story about the satanic verses, you know, and, um, and thinking, you know, that's a good story. Tell, uh, can you briefly say the story? Oh, well, it's just this, this idea, this, this story is that there are these three pagan deities, female pagan deities, winged female deities, whose temples stood at the gates of the city of Mecca and were very powerful. And I mean, some of this is just speculation, but the speculation is that basically these, fa these temples were owned by the most powerful families in, in the city. And everybody, it's a big trading city, so everybody's coming and going with caravans and so on. And everybody coming and going makes offerings at these temples, or as we would put it, pays taxes. <laughs> And, and so the enormous income to the ruling families of the city that came from these three temples was, very, you know, it was a very important factor in the politics of the city. And so it appears that what may have happened is that the Prophet, in the early days of Islam, was it, that it, it was suggested to him that if he could accept these three deities as part of the Islamic pantheon, then the religion would not be persecuted. And not that the, the, he was not asked to accept them as being at the same level as God, but you know he already had angels. He had the archangel Gabriel coming to bring the revelation and so on. So, so he already had winged creatures who were like secondary supernatural entities. And so it was suggested you know maybe just have just have three more, and and then everything's cool. Anyway, so he there's this according to the story he goes up the mountain where he used to go to meditate and meet the angel, and came down with verses which appeared to accept these three pagan deities. Um, and then we don't know what happened. I mean, we can speculate about whether that created dissension amongst the believers or whether the governing bodies of the city welched on their side of the deal or what, I don't know what happened. But at a certain point after that, Again, we don't know whether that's a week later or a year later, but he goes back up the mountain and comes back down to say that he has been deceived and that on the previous visit, the devil appeared to him in the guise of the archangel to give him these verses. And therefore, the verses were not the verses of God, they were satanic verses. And they should be removed from the Quran, which they were, and were replaced by other verses. Um, the verses which replaced them are interesting because they say they use the femaleness of these deities as proof that they can't be part of the Godhead. Shall God have daughters while you have sons? That would be an unjust division. See? So, I mean, interesting, right? Um, and that's a story which is in several of the traditions of the prophet. So anyway, I, found, I learned this at Cambridge, age 20. And I thought, interesting story, you know. That was 1968. 20, 20 years, years later. later. <laughs> found out how good a story it was. <laughs> <laughs>